This episode of The Good Stuff is brought to you in part by Comic Burst. There I was, walking into the Sheraton Grand Hotel in Chicago to join with top physicists from all over the world. We're there because in a few moments, representatives from CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, are going to make what could be a groundbreaking announcement that would change our understanding of the universe forever. You see, back in December of 2015, scientists working at the Large Hadron Collider noticed a blip in their data. There. Right there. That's the blip. It may not look like much, but that bump had potentially huge implications for the world of physics. If that data was confirmed, then it would indicate that scientists had discovered a new particle. This would be huge and could potentially usher in a whole new era of physics. Yeah, I mean, it's a pretty interesting topic. Um, as you see from the audience, a lot of people are interested. Are you excited? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But I think enough stuff has been leaked already that the excitement's kind of died down by this point. Okay, so to be perfectly honest, before the conference there had been rumors floating around the physics community that the data that the LHC had reported wasn't a new particle, but a statistical fluctuation. As time went on, what started off as potentially a huge discovery was beginning to look more and more like nothing. Are you optimistic at all that they've discovered a new particle? Uh, I, I am... I want to wait and see. Okay. <laughs> that's kind of the, that's the best answer. This is Andre de Govea, professor at Northwestern University and a theoretical particle physicist. So if, if I were to make a bet, I would probably not bet on this particle. Okay. However, there's a good reason for that, because if I bet against it, I always win. Okay. <laughs> because if I lose the bet, then that means there's a new particle, which is exciting. Uh, if I win the bet, at least I make a little bit of money. It's a win-win situation. It's a win-win situation. Like a true scientist, Andre had a healthy amount of skepticism. But despite all the negative rumors, you could tell from the packed conference room that there was still some hope that this could be real. So, good morning everyone. I'm glad to present some recent and very recent results on the search for uh, high mass photon resonance from Atlas. So I'm going to be showing you the results that were produced using the LHC data collected in 2015. And this is the description of the high electron invariant mass from the Z2E decay. So this is probably the best no one predicted by uh, simulations of true photon events. On the left is the 2016 data only, and on the right is the 2015 plus 2016 data, and there is no significant excess seen in the 2016 data, in particular between uh, around 700 uh, to 800 GB. No significant excess. Okay, thank you very much. Uh... Okay, so there's no new particle. Well, not yet, anyway. Show's over, folks. I gotta say, though, when I first found out about this potential new discovery, I was pretty excited, and I wasn't the only one. When scientists at the LHC first reported what was known as a diphoton bump, over 400 papers were written by theoretical physicists all over the world, with a wide range of possible explanations. But how did this happen? Why were scientists so excited about a blip in some data? I've always been mildly obsessed with trying to figure out how things work, and when it comes to the basic laws and building blocks of nature, I feel like we're only beginning to scratch the surface of what's actually going on. The search for the fundamental particles that make up our universe can be traced all the way back to ancient Greece, where the philosopher Democritus theorized that nature was composed of tiny, indivisible particles called atoms. This idea was largely ignored at the time until the 1800s, when scientists began developing atomic theory and were finally able to prove the existence of atoms. However, they soon discovered that their initial assumption was wrong. Atoms were not fundamental particles. They actually contained smaller pieces. The search for the basic building blocks of nature culminated in a little something called the Standard Model, a complete diagram of all the known particles in the universe. The Standard Model is made up of quarks and leptons, which include the electrons and neutrinos, and bosons, which are the force-carrying particles. It is an extremely robust model that has been experimentally verified over and over again. But unfortunately, it's not a complete theory. Not by a long shot. So one interesting thing about the types of theories that we have now, like the standard model of particle physics, we know that there are questions that that model cannot answer. Mm -hmm. We know that it will fail miserably. We know that there are phenomena mm -hmm. that we've observed that indicate to us that there are more particles and that uh, those particles are required to explain stuff 
that the standard model gets wrong. Here's four of the top things a standard model can't explain. Number one, dark energy. The universe is expanding at an accelerated rate and we have no idea why. Number two, there's more matter than antimatter. According to the standard model, there should be equal parts of both. But if that were the case, then things like stars and planets wouldn't exist. And I think it's fair to say that they do. Number three, dark matter. It accounts for 85% of the matter in the universe, but it doesn't behave like any of the standard model particles. And number four, neutrino mass. According to the standard model, the mass of neutrinos should be zero, but it's not. They have mass. It's really small, but it's there. In fact, the standard model can only explain observable matter, which by some estimates only accounts for about 4% of the total mass and energy of the universe. The rest is a complete mystery. This is why scientists are pretty sure that there's at least a few more particles out there. But how do you find a new particle? The search for the fundamental building blocks of our universe has evolved over the years, but in many ways the basic principle has stayed the same. Essentially, you build a device that generates particles, you accelerate them, collide them into something else, and then look and see what comes out the other side. The problem though is that if you want to see these more elusive particles like the Higgs boson, you need a lot of energy, which means you need a really big accelerator. You need a Large Hadron Collider. Bum, bum, bum. Large, in fact, may be a bit of an understatement. Straddling the France-Switzerland border, the LHC is comprised of a 27-kilometer loop where two beams of protons are accelerated up to 99.9999% the speed of light and then smashed together. It is the largest and most powerful particle accelerator in the world, the largest single machine in the world, and it's just freaking awesome. Located strategically around the accelerator ring are a handful of detectors used to detect particle collisions. The two main detectors are called ATLAS and CMS. Each of these detectors has a completely different design and is run by separate teams of people, but we'll get to why that's important later. When two protons collide together in the LHC, a lot of crazy stuff happens. Sometimes, heavy, more elusive particles like the Higgs boson are created in the wake of the collision. These unstable particles only exist for a fraction of a second and then quickly decay into other particles, like a pair of photons, for example. When this happens, the original Higgs particle goes away, but its properties like energy and angular momentum are conserved in the new particles. Kind of like how in the show Friends ended, it was immediately followed by that spin-off series Joey. Although for the purposes of this analogy, you have to also imagine that there was another show called Chandler and then like everyone else from Friends or something like that. I could probably think of a better title, but let's just go with that for now. Anyways, if for some reason you've never seen the show Friends, you could sort of get a sense of what it was like by watching those other spin-off shows and adding up their properties, like the characters, overall comedic value, etc. I've never actually seen Joey, but I heard it wasn't supposed to be that good. Likewise, in the Large Hadron Collider, physicists will often look for specific particles like pairs of photons that are a byproduct of the collisions. By adding up the energy of these photons, you can make a reasonable guess about which kind of particle they came from. This is exactly how the Higgs was discovered in 2012. So this is how you discover a particle that you know is there. Uh -huh. So how do you discover a particle that you don't know is there? The process is philosophically the same. Mm -hmm. uh, you either have theories that predict the existence of a new particle that decays in a certain way, so you look for them. Mm -hmm. So if you know what you're looking for, it's always easier. Or you just uh, look for stuff. So what people found out last year, or what they reported at the end of last year, was that by looking at this diphoton spectrum, they saw a little, a new bump. Mm -hmm. at 750 GeV. 750 GeV is the energy where the bump was discovered and was thought to be the mass of the new particle. That's, you know, five, five or six times heavier than the Higgs boson itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what people got very excited about. So how do you tell if the bump in your data is an actual new particle or a statistical fluke? Science has changed a lot over the years. It's very unlikely that a major breakthrough can be made these days by a lone scientist operating out of a home laboratory or abandoned castle or whatever. Nowadays, you need giant machines that cost millions of dollars and teams of scientists pouring over mountains of data to make a new discovery. This isn't always the case, of course, but it does seem to be how most major discoveries in the realm of physics are made these days. When the Atlas detector first announced the diphoton bump, it seemed pretty significant. In fact, they calculated that there was only about a 1 in 7,000 chance that it was a statistical fluctuation. Now this alone sounds pretty significant, but if you take into account the fact that about 1 billion collisions occur every second, a statistical fluctuation of this significance is not totally out of the question. However, what really got people excited was that CMS, the other detector at the LHC, 
also reported a similar bump at 750 GeV. An anomaly in one detector could just mean that there's something wrong with the detector, but if you see the same thing in two different detectors, there's a pretty good chance that there's something going on. However, when Atlas and CMS combined the new data from 2016 with the old data, any significance that was once there had disappeared completely. So far, the search for physics beyond the standard model has come up with nothing. The LHC is still the frontier that we just started exploring, uh -huh. and there's a lot of optimism for hoping to see something there. Cool. But there's no guarantee, right. so that's different. Yeah. But that's sort of how science works, yeah. right? I mean, you don't, uh, if you knew what the answer was, you wouldn't be doing it. Do you ever think that we'll get to the most basic fundamental equations that explain everything? Um, so me personally, no. <laughs> Does that frustrate you at all that you may never understand the most basic laws of nature? Not really, no, it's, it's kind of better. I it's mean, better? It's, okay. It, so we have one way of describing everything. And, uh, and that way allows you to make a bunch of predictions. So you go out, you do a lot of experiments, and you find that some of your predictions are wrong. Then you kind of go back to the drawing board and you say, so how do I fix that? And then you go out and you make more predictions and then people go out and make more measurements and there's sort of a, a lot of back and forth with the measurements and the predictions. And that's the process, you know, mm -hmm. that's the way that we make progress. And every once in a while, there are these very big jumps. Mm -hmm. Every once in a while, something really big happens that says, this way of thinking about things is just not gonna work. Mm -hmm. We need to start thinking about it in a very different way. But there is one last implication of this non-discovery. For years, scientists have been coming up with theories to explain the biggest mysteries in the universe, and it seemed likely that some evidence for these theories would be found in the LHC. The fact that no unknown particles have been discovered yet could mean that some of these questions don't have anything to do with particle physics. Either way though, a big part of science is about ruling out possible explanations. So in a sense, finding nothing could be just as big of a breakthrough as finding a new particle. Definitely not as exciting though, but what are you going to do? Science for you. But what do you guys think? Do you think we'll be able to find answers to some of these big questions at the LHC? Or should we be looking elsewhere? Let us know in the comments or hit us up on Twitter. This episode has been made possible in part by Comic Burst. Comic Burst is an online marketplace dedicated to helping you complete your comic collection. At Comic Burst, you can find a whole bunch of comics, both old and new. A link to their website can be found in the description below. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Special thanks to our Patreon subscribers for making this episode possible. And special thanks to our Kickstarter backers for making this entire season possible. In our last video about the development and impact of barbed wire, a lot of you pointed out that the land that was being fenced off once belonged to Native Americans and had been forcibly taken from them. This is true. A whole host of cultures existed on the American continent long before the United States even appeared, and the government, army, and pioneers had essentially engaged in a decades-long war against these people, forcibly relocating them and murdering them. This was in the back of my mind the entire time I was making this video, and I really struggled to figure out how I would address this. A passing mention of it seemed like it would be a disservice to what is probably the largest black mark on the history of the United States, so I didn't mention it, hoping that the tragic subtext would somehow come through. This was a mistake, and I think the video is flawed because of it. But I'm glad you guys brought it up, because it needs to be addressed, and it's an aspect of our history that should never be omitted and never forgotten. Next week, we're gonna take a look at our poop and see all the amazing things we can do with it or at least with the bacteria that eats it. Like we can generate electricity. You'll just have to see. <laughs>